All right, welcome to season five of the SOB podcast. I'm John Shrek McPhee, the Sheriff of Baghdad. Today, episode five, number two, we got my man Dutch. Uh, I know Dutch a long time. We do some catching up. We talk about some great stuff. Uh, man, I know Dutch a long time. So, hey, uh, take it away. Here comes Dutch. So stand by. All right, I'm John Shrek McPhee, the Sheriff of Baghdad. I'm here with my man Dutch, and I'm just going to shoot you guys straight. This is fucking take two, and I'll tell you why, is I fucked up <laughs> the first one, like, settings. <laughs> Technology is not it's not your fucking friend, so remember that. All right, so it's SOB podcast. I'm here with my man Dutch. Uh I known this guy a long time, man, a long, long time, right? And uh, we started out in the same place, so I'm gonna kick it to him, Dutch. Good morning. Tell us a little about yourself, dude. Good morning, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to see you again. It was great to see you again last week when we tried this uh, take one. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it was a long time. I'm a long timer, so I'm a 31 year guy. Uh, 26 in special operations. Uh, most of that 26 was with John in 175 and then moved over to the unit in 99 and uh, retired in 13 and worked for the government for a little while, worked for an armor company for a little while, and now do my own thing like some of these other cats do. But now I'm just way behind the power curve. And uh, so, yeah, military, law enforcement, and specially selected great Americans that want to be better at rifle, pistol, CQB, K9 integration, stuff like that. And uh, this year is our first year really is DCM consulting my first year to create a whole year calendar. So, and I'm already counseling, uh, uh, classes cause nobody's showing up just yet. So, but that's all right. Yeah. It'll happen. <laughs> no, it takes time, man. None of it's uh instant. You know what I mean? Hey, tell me about, yeah. tell me what you're like as a kid. Like, what'd you do? Did you play sports? Like, what were you like as a, as a little kid? Like pre high school. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Aussie and Harriet background, right? Pr pretty much, uh, <laughs> Ward and June Cleaver. That's my mom and dad, Ward, Ward and June Cleaver. Uh, I was the middle brother of three and, uh, I was born in 64, man. So I was born in California. I was actually born in uh, Canoga Park, what? California. Yeah, my brother was born in Riverside. And I was born in Canoga Park. And then we came back to Pennsylvania. Mom and dad are from Central PA. And they wanted to come back and live closer to the family as everyone died and whatnot. And so we, we settled in Western Pennsylvania. And that was my formative years. Uh, when I was a little kid, man, we played Army in the backyard all the time. <laughs> And that is a funny thing. My I'm, my first my first ever issued weapon was a 1911 A1 when I was because I was an armor crewman. In 1982 it was my first year in the army, and I got a 1911 A1 pistol. But when I was a kid, I played every time I played out in the army yard. I climbed trees, and you know other kids would make fun of us. So what? But I had a, a green plastic 1911 i thought was the shit man that was my gun man. yeah i had uh like brown um pistol grip man it was it was the heat anyways i was always was my favorite i would always pick it yeah. but I, I i spent a lot of time as a kid watching vic morrow and 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 uh that show called uh, combat yeah and just you know watching world war ii movies and i i you know i studied all that stuff man i studied armored warfare when i was a kid i did my term paper on Irwin rommel and george Patton. i wanted to be a tanker man i want to be part of the combined arms Lollapalooza, and uh crush people in tanks and i did i ended up doing that but i saw my the error of my ways and said i need to be infantryman so in the end i came back across yeah 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 Hey, uh, I had, check this out, this is probably dating myself, but when I was a kid, I had the old Guns of the Navarone, and I would watch that. Oh, yeah. Be Lee, Marvin, all those guys. Oh, yeah, man. Like, I know my parents had to be tired of me watching that stuff, but we did the same thing. We played war, BB gun wars, one pump BB gun wars, which when you got a welt on the side of your face and you got to go home, you're like, one pump my ass, motherfuckers. I, I, <laughs> this is the days of no eye pro. <laughs> nothing, nothing. Nobody's wearing eye pro. Get shot in the face. Nobody's wearing eye pro. Stupid. <laughs> no, 
I never wore a seatbelt in my life. (laughs) You know what I mean? I remember being a kid. My real dad had this, I think it was a Polaris, like 440, like an old Dodge cop car, the fucking big one. You know what I mean? I remember as a kid, like laying down in the back window, like the sun would shine on you and I could lay in the back like window and sleep up there as we were driving around. You know what I mean? Like fucking people today don't even know. Uh, what yeah, kind no, of we, we drove all across the night, all across the nation. It would never, yeah, whatever, yeah, doing whatever you want. Yeah, go ahead. And I, hey, look, maybe that's why we are where we are is because we didn't have helmets <laughs> as kids. You know what I mean? I don't. It's know. Quite, I don't quite know. Quite possible. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What kind of sports you play as kids? So I was, uh, I was backwards, bro. I didn't. Uh, I wanted to play sports, but I was never really good at it. My schooling was never really good uh going through elementary and junior high school so i was never really good at it uh i played some like local football and then i played uh local baseball i tried out for the baseball team in high school and i failed but i became the number one comeback player in my like my whatever league you want to call that like town league you know the townies uh so that was cool i played left field and and uh catcher on occasion uh skated some not much i love hockey but i did played a lot of street hockey but i didn't play uh, a lot of ice hockey same and, uh, that was about it yeah same. Oh, i was on the rifle team too i was on the rifle team mm. what kind of rifle and, team we didn't have anything like that where i grew up but yeah there were 22s they were 22s uh there were some buffoons on that team i learned a lot of good things about you know shooting a rifle but that was dude that was the you know you had a rifle jacket you know you had a shooting yeah. jacket uh, yeah not like not unlike carlos Hathcock did maybe when he was doing the the right. stuff at cherry point yeah. um and you had to get strapped in and it was pretty cool my brother was better at it than i was but it was good my yeah. brother and i were on the same team for a while not super cool yeah i never uh man we didn't have anything like that matter of fact when i was in kindergarten i still got it my mom gave it to me if, like a couple years before she died but uh, it was like i was at kindergarten they're like what do you want for christmas so uh, I drew a rifle. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and then, so what? I wouldn't get, I remember drawing it so I wouldn't get in trouble because, like, I grew up in Chicago. All guns are bad, right? To include, well, the police have guns. Yeah, they're bad too. That's how my family thinks. But hey, whatever, right? Um, I drew, I so I drew a string and a little cork. Like, I wanted a cork gun that pops the cork out of the end, like a toy gun. Uh, but the reality is, is, yo, I wanted that rifle. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, man. The same as you. Yeah, I was, a, I was a big baseball kid. I played baseball and wrestling. And before I went to high school, yearly in the summer, I'd go to the University of Michigan for the wrestling camps uh, as a kid. And like, I don't know. Uh, my parents never came to my games, never did shit with me or my brother. You know what I mean? So it was like, uh, when I went to wrestling camp, it was kind of nice cause they would let me go. Right. And they would let me go with the team and the coach and stuff like that. But, uh, they weren't coming to watch or they weren't anything like that. So when it was summer, it was kind of nice. It was like me getting away from them. You know what I mean? So I always loved that as a kid, but yeah, I wrestled and played baseball was my two. Um, all right. Tell me, uh, tell me after high school, did you join the army right away or? Yeah, I did. I, so right away. As a matter of fact, I joined in 81, uh, delayed entry program. And then I graduated high school in June, right? Somewhere there. And then it was two weeks later, I was in, I was in basic training. Uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky was my one station unit training for armor. And uh, I tell you the first couple of days, bro, I was ready to quit. <laughs> the, I, I, t- I tell you what, one of the stories I tell for basic training, I really like, and it's, uh, uh, where were we? We were, you, you're, you, you're in processing and you're getting your drill sergeants and everybody's, you know, getting yelled at and screamed at. And again, this is 82. So it was kind of almost every one of my drill sergeants were Vietnam vets. 101st Airborne, 2nd ACR, uh, 25th Infantry Division. Um, so there was a lot of hardcore dudes. Sergeant O'Reilly, who was the, the uh, senior drill sergeant, was uh, 101st Airborne, Vietnam vet. And he was, he was mean, man. They're all mean. They were, but you know, it was the, to me, it was the better army as I, you know, as you go back and you look at these other guys again, but, uh, cause I had the benefit of going through basic training twice. Um, but I did this 
And, you know, they would throw beds out the window, uh, fire, fire watch, you know, fire, you know, when you, mm-hmm. you, you fire had, guard. Yeah. Fire guard. That was, that was real because guys smoked cigarettes in the barracks. Yeah. yeah. There was ash, ash cans. Yeah. yeah. It was the whole thing. Um, hey, my boys fire. are like, my boys are like, what's fire guard for dad? This is stupid. Yeah. It's like, yo, you're not in a world war two building where everyone smokes like fucking chimneys and it, the yeah. whole thing will burn in 10 fucking seconds. You know what I mean? Like you got to you don't even know what that is. And they're like, Oh, is that what it was for? Like, that's why they call it fire guard? Because you're looking for fire, right? It's a real deal. Yeah. That, that's yeah. funny, right? Yeah, for, yeah. For, it meant something. Then uh, it was I was I was falling asleep or something. You know, I don't know what it was. And uh, guy tells me he, he gets, rips me out and, and he says, you know, do some push-ups. How many push-ups can you do? I don't know. Joe Start. Well, here we're gonna find out. You know, do some push-ups. <laughs> and he's like, you're falling asleep in the class. Of the first arm, the first arm, first arm, Peterson. He led men in Vietnam <laughs> next to God, and he. I'm like, uh, you know, I, I didn't know. Shit. I was a, I was a dumbass, but I didn't really realize my. I really wanted to be an infantryman later on, and yeah. so, yeah. So I got out of the army in '86. I mm. stayed affiliated with National Guard units so I could keep my time. Yeah, but I came back in again in '91, uh, '92, and um, came back in as an infantryman. Wow. Got a ranger contract and boom. And that's that's when I met you. Yep. Yeah. One seven five. When did we meet? 94, 93, 94, 95? Yeah. When? When, uh, let's see. You got there. I was already there. I think uh, the first – yeah, I'd met you a few times when I think when you first got there. But I hadn't really like hung out or talked to you. And I think there was a couple things we did where like, you know, every once in a great while you'd meet some guys or – you're you're with guys from another company and then oh, like, detail you know, yeah like a detail or something i think we had done some stuff together um and do i you remember we... do you remember so my big controversy coming in because i was a previously a soldier right and i had five years in or so and um i came back in as an e4 but i wasn't I wasn't a, uh, what do we call them dudes? Uh, yeah. Uh, what, yeah. Uh, non-tabbed. You were non-tabbed. <clears throat> yeah, but I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't come from another unit. Oh, you I were, uh, you were, uh, <clears throat> an import. You're an import. I was, no, I wasn't. See, that was the thing. Cause I went, an import doesn't have to go through rip. Right. And all that junk. I was, I went through the whole deal. Airborne right. rip. Right, right, right. Bam, 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 and yeah, I yeah. came up, and I, so I wasn't an import, but I was a, an anomaly. But the problem was, I had some time time seniority or whatever, and they had to make me, they had and they had to put me up for E five, and that's that was unheard of, right? You can't yeah. do that as a yeah. non tab. You can't stay here yeah. as a leader. You can't do that. Right. So, uh, so they ushered me off to Ranger School real quick, and I was a horrible swimmer, and I failed uh, the wintertime swim because it was like you know breaking the ice in the water. And uh, I failed that thing, and I came back. And th- anyway, they finally pushed me, but I I got promoted to five before I got my tab. So mm. nobody wanted to shake my hand in formation. It was very weird controversy, man. And uh, then I got to Ranger School, and I remember I'm in the mountains, right? And you know your your collar looks different. That that stripe is bigger than a, a private or a yeah, a private yeah. You know, first class or even yeah. a, a specialist. And uh, the guy said, uh, the drill instructor, right? Or sorry, ranger instructor looking at me. And he goes, are you, are you a medic? I said, no, Sean. He goes, oh, you're a co- communicator then, right? I go, no, Sean. He looks around. He kind of goes, you're the one. <laughs> <laughs> so it's you. He's like, he's like, you're the one. You're the, you're the, yeah. you're the anomaly. What happened? You know what I'm like? Oh, dude, yeah. I have to, I have to pass this. I have to pass this. It's you. It was you it's all you. along. Right. I was, like I, I felt, I felt horrible. Right. I'm now I'm marked. Everybody yeah. knows me. These yeah. people are in Dahlonega, Georgia. They know me. No, for real. Real talk right there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember uh I remember these discussions, the import discussions, and I remember I think when I met you I was already back. When did you go to range school? 93ish, 94. Yeah. Yeah, yeah 3 I, or 4 somewhere. I got, yeah, I had, I had already just got back, right? And I think that's when I met I met you and then I think uh guys are like, "Oh, you see this import over here and Bco get promoted." And I was like, "Wait a minute, I was just with that guy. He's not an import. He just came in the army a second time. Does that is that an import? 
right? And uh, guys would like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I guess, right? <laughs> but like, but I will tell you, like, when I was a private, we did have a few E4s that came in, like, college degrees. Yeah. Those guys never did well, right? So here you are, a regular guy, prior service, walking into the same shitty situation as, like, these guys who go to legal school think they're going to come to Ranger Battalion and, and fucking they're smarter and better than us all. And the guy just fucking quits in like fucking two weeks. Right. Because Dude, I love the whole idea of the Ranger thing, you know, so I was I loved the Ranger history. You know, I love World War Two history anyway. So I love all that. And I'm, I'm I'm getting smoked on my first day in the hallway and I'm answering all the questions correctly. Yeah. And then Sergeant, Sergeant Kyle, Micah Kyle, I don't know if you remember him from BCO. Yeah. Yeah. He comes out and he goes, he goes, hey. How do you know all the answers? I go, uh, I studied. I like it. I don't know. I don't, this is super, it's an interesting <laughs> question. I don't understand. I know the questions because I know the, I know the answers because I like the questions, but he pulled me off in a room and he said, who, you know, wh who are you? What's the deal here? Cause I was 26, 27 years old and I'm smoking all the kids there. You know, I'm, I'm yeah. still, I'm, I'm like, uh, what's going on here? You know? So yeah, they found me out and they put a picture of me in the hallway of my old uniform. When I was doing, I just, they found a dress uniform picture of me somewhere or whatever. And put me in the uniform. Yeah. Oh my, I had ribbons and crap on, you know, like who the hell is this dude, man? Um, they probably wrote on it. Look at this leg right here. Right. Like, I, used be, I used to be a staff sergeant and I, you know, here I am, uh, uh, E4. <laughs> oh shit. That's funny as fuck. Man. The whole thing was weird, man. It was weird. Yeah. It was a strange journey, but I was really, really happy to be, um, really happy to make the journey obviously and then and then coming up you know i was the only dude i, I don't know i don't know what i don't know when the recruiter guy comes in and says hey we have this thing we you know we want you know junior and senior ncos to go to and then i go to the theater and i and i'm the only guy there yeah i'm the only guy there i'm like how am i the only guy here this is a mandatory thing i i thought and then uh, i watched the video and i go this video is really cool. These guys, uh, they got it going on. This is yeah. really cool. This I'd like to maybe, way. I'd like to maybe test my metal and see if I could be one of these guys. And uh, so then I'll make the decision to, to jump the light speed. And there you go. Yeah. I, uh, I went to seventh group first. Uh, you know, I was always kind of close. Me and were kind of close. Right. And just fucking up and left one day from Ranger Battalion. Gone forever. You know what I mean? And it was like, I never seen him again. Years later, I went to, you know, I was on his team. Like, I worked for him. I'm like, you know, like this me whole beat, time. Man. And what I realized was, is, A, I went to seventh group. I went to SFAS, passed. I went to the Q course, right? It fucking sucked in the early 90s. You know, my team sergeant wasn't, uh, he was a hard worker. He wasn't lazy or anything, but he could be a dick, like, a lot because, he was like army drill sergeant of the year. And they said, Hey, what do you want to do with the rest of your career as an E7? He said, he want to go to the special forces. So all of a sudden the senior E7 gets to go to special forces. He gets his own team immediately. He's an E8. They need all the E8s you could get. And like, um, he was a decent guy. He always treated me fair. Cause I worked hard. I tried hard, you know, everything I did, I did like, you know, okay, I'm going to do this the best I can. But uh, it kind of sucked, man. I was only there ten months, and I went to the real selection. And uh, dude, dude went, can I, I ask you a question then? Yeah. So, when you were in one seven five, what made you think you had to jump to the Green Berets? Oh, easy, right? Because you always hear unit guys. You got to be married. You got to be older and more mature. I got to be honest. I'm fucking 50 some years old. I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. And if, if, if there's adult supervision, you better have one of my fucking kids take over because we'll be fucking around in no time if you leave me in charge. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've never been so those you things. So I, I stayed away from it thinking... I'm not ready, right? As a as a guy, but that's just all fucking rumors. It's based off of nothing because and I'll tell you why it's based off of nothing because the only fucking stories you hear in Ranger Battalion or in the army about the unit is from guys who fucking failed. That's hey, it. So you so you're telling me that you prepped all this in your mind. You thought that I mean you were going to do so so that's that's cool though that you prepped that. Yeah. So I never prepped any of that and I just and I was already older anyway. I'm, I mean, I'm older than you right now, I think, just by a couple of years. But yeah, I'm, I just, I was just like, 
well, I just want to try that. You know, yeah. it's, it seems to me like Fuller. Fuller went, uh, Fromke went. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And these guys were young, and they just went, and they did really well. And I'm like, well, that seems to me like this is the normal path for of professionalism, you know, to go to the next step. Agree. But I just wondered about the Green Beret thing for you because because a lot of the kids would come to me and say, I hate the regular time. I hate it. I hate the discipline. <laughs> I hate it. I want to be a Green Beret. There's better things out there. And I would tell them that's not necessarily true. Think about the numbers. Can we put things in perspective, please? Because there's probably 10,000 or so shooters in all the Green Beret elements combined. But Rangers, there's probably only 2,000 shooters. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll say, who, who, who's more unique in this respect? I mean, right. maybe the Ranger Battalion right. in this case. Right. But Yeah, I was uh, – when I left Battalion, it was also – remember uh, Baldridge? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Baldridge told me one day we were out on the PT field – and he was his normal talking shit self, right? And I'm, I, you know, I'm at like a tab spec four, but like, I'm not a take your shit kind of guy. You know what I mean? So Baldridge, just sergeant, you know, first Ranger Battalion Sergeant Major is like, hey, Ranger, I'll bend you over your my desk and fuck you in the ass. I was like, I don't think you could fucking take me, Sergeant Major. I don't think that's going to happen ever. And ever since then, he didn't like me. So he came down with the, if you've been here more than five years, you're going to have to go somewhere else. Remember that? And then like, dude, other guys in my platoon, E5s, E6s are like Korea, 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 fucking Germany. And I'm like, this dude's for real. He's not fucking around with this, right? So uh, I was like, I got to go somewhere. And then it was like, well... From everything I've heard, I'm not mature enough for the unit yet. So let me try this special forces thing, right? And and I get no, it. it's that makes total sense. I would have done the same thing. I think. Yeah, I wish I, just I wanted... could have a told me years later. Why the fuck didn't you just come here? I was like, I don't know. I don't know, right? Like, and then, but that's a that's a fair question, and I think I was uh, a victim of listening to those around me talk about stuff that they weren't qualified or they don't have the context to talk about because it's all just hearsay off of what another guy said or what happened to him when you know there's guys that disappear and you know there's guys that come back yeah so so you get to talk how, to? how long how long did you spend just you said less than a year in a team yeah. 10 months 10 months i was on a team the first time Damn. I was a group. yeah 10th yeah. 10th ten, ten group uh, seventh. I was here yeah. at Bragg. Yeah. I've always been here at Bragg. So, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, you know, you can, you can choose worse places. But I will tell you this. I will tell you this is like when I left the unit to go back to an SF uh, company, right? I had my own team. I was my own troops, our major, because we organized just like, you know, the unit does because we worked under you guys. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, but we worked under you guys specifically for a long time before um, before uh, A rolled in, right? I was at the house with you guys. I lived down in house two. <laughs> he put me in house two. We used to roll for Dito every night. <laughs> How about that? I guess I don't know yeah. that. I guess yeah. I, I should have known that. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So, I was kind of, you know, went back to group. I was kind of leadership because I'd already done my team leader time. You know what I mean? I was already kind of senior year eight kind of deal. Uh, and what I would tell you is I think, um, you know, guys talk about the differences or, you know, difference between the unit or the SEALs or the Rangers or SF or whatever. Guys talk about all that. But I would tell you this is uh, the only real difference is I think special forces leadership because special forces these days does not just choose from the army, second enlistment stuff, right? Uh, you end up getting some leadership that creates parallel tracks to what the army does and they don't really know what the suck is about. You know what I mean? Like you sucked in Ranger Battalion. You know, you know what the fucking suck is about. And it's like, 
we don't have to do that if we're trying to get better here today. You know, there's a time where you got to suck yeah. it up, right? But there's yeah. times where if I'm trying to make you better at skills, at, at any technical aspect, you need to know, you need to know this, right? This is the army. The army's like, here's a machine gun. Go shoot, kid. We showed you how. In the unit's like, do you know how to use this? If the answer is no, yeah. someone will show you probably better than you could show yourself, right? Like, so that's what I realized was... Uh, the, you don't know what you don't know, right? There's more of that in special forces than in the unit. Cause in the unit, if you don't know, you're like, I don't fucking know. Uh, can we talk to somebody? How the fuck we pull this off? I don't know shit about this, this piece of gear or this tech or whatever. Right. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. think that was like the big thing <clears throat> for me. The big eye opener was the, uh, the, you don't know what you don't know. And I'd also say this is the guys in special forces, like, I'll tell you this as a team leader in the unit, like if I would have said, okay, guys, throw your gas masks on, you know, on a, on a random Tuesday, right? With no advance warning, throw your gas masks on. We're going to do the long O course, short O course, hit every range, every wall on the way back, already prepped targets, right? Guys in the unit, if you sprung that on the guys, they'd be like, that's fucking stupid. I'm not doing it. Right? <laughs> not doing that. That's quite man. possible, I, right? I got Unless other you had some sort of I got tyrannical other leader. Totally right. I've but, heard some stories though. I've heard some stories of tyrannical leaders. No, calling, no, no. I hear dudes in. Hey, when I was in special forces, the more crueler shit I could think up for these motherfuckers, the more they loved it. Why? Because no one was doing that for them. You know what I mean? No one was pushing them to their limits. No one was thinking up, you know, the old, you know, remember the old slapathon? Like I love slapathon. Oh yeah, no, yeah, I love slapathon. I uh uh the slapathon or the iron headathon or the yeah. you know what I mean? Like the guys never did that. And as a leader, the more cruel, <laughs> complex, and fucked up this is, the more guys' eyes were like, <gasps> let's do that again. They're like, are you fucking high? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh guys loved it, man. So I would tell you this is I don't look the unit selection works. You know this. I know this. Right. It works. Uh, but I would say this. There's a lot of good dudes in the army just looking for just some leadership or, yeah, or 100%. maybe for the first time they even be challenged. Do you know what I mean? hundred percent. So I, Everything I do, I do it under the banner of leadership. You know, I, I worked with men like you, uh, our people, everything, everywhere you go, it doesn't matter who you're training. It doesn't right. matter if you're training in Bogota or it doesn't matter if you're training in Poland with the Grom. It doesn't matter if you're in Egypt or whatever. It's the whole, it's leadership. It's leadership they want. It's leadership they crave. And there's a certain amount of guys that can do that. There's a certain amount of guys that can reach out and, and really harness and, and teach these kids what to do. Um, and then when it comes to our people, you know, everybody's like sharks or wolves in the, in the den. And you gotta, man, you gotta, yeah, you know, you, you, you can't do something stupid. Otherwise you're gonna have a mutiny on your hands. You have to do stuff that's, you have to be competent, right? As a team leader, you have to be competent, man. Totally. Um, yeah. It's just, it's uh man, it's, it's funny. I'll tell you one of the things I always prided myself on more than anything else in the Ranger Creed was technically proficient. Nice. Yeah. And I'll tell you why. How, look, you give a guy a radio, and you know this. Give an assaulter a radio. Tell him to get to the ISR freak. Does he know where it is and how to get there, generally speaking? You know what I mean? Like, And yeah. then something so simple all the way back on the dial up to. Like, you know, uh, a lot of times, like, um, I'm the guy where – I always accepted hip pocket training. What are we going to do today? Hip pocket training. Hey, we're working on radios, right? Because these little things is like, what if I'm, I can't tell you how many night, like, you know, and you've done this too, right? I'm not telling you anything. You're, you're running after a guy and you switch, you switch to the ISR freak. So you're just talking to the guy fucking watching him instead of your boss telling you, uh, turn left, like turn left, yeah. motherfucker. Too how late. About a, I don't need a left or right. I need a compass direction from here, right? So uh, to av avoid any of that confusion, uh, what I always like to do is be technically proficient. If you give me something, I want if it's on my body and I'm carrying it. I want to know how to use it to the nth degree, to include how to use it wrong. Like I could break a window with this thing too. You know what I mean? Like, what does it do for me, right? So I've always apprised technically proficient, and then I've heard some like 
you know, guys throw out hater comments on the internet. Like I've heard guys talking shit about me on the internet and read it, you know, read the comments, you know, and guys are like, you know, they say this guy's a major asshole, but you know, the guys on the ground with him said he's a tactical genius, you know? And it's like, do you know what the fuck you're talking about right now? You know what I mean? Because I'll tell you why you're an asshole. Cause time is of the fucking essence and someone's got to do the work. And when you're in charge, you got to tell someone something, right? Always. So this is something that we've talked about before. Everyone in a leadership position gets MF'd ever. It doesn't matter. You're going to get MF'd. You're going to get MF'd no matter who you are, what you've done, where you're going. Good leaders, bad leaders, everybody gets MF'd, man. You're just going to have to deal with that and, and and continue. If you know the why and if you can articulate the why, then then let it go. But yeah, everybody gets MF'd, man. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, my thing is always tactically proficient. Now, um, the next thing for me is skills, right? And you and I look at skills as everything I could be asked to do. I don't look at skills as like, I need to learn how to do this or that. I look at skills as it is your core. It is your inner being. It is your competence. It is your confidence. It is your uh, proficiency. It is your, and that core of a human being. And I used to tell all the guys like skydive as much as possible, crash cars as much as possible, shoot as much as possible, right? Do it all as much as possible. Go to the dojo and let someone kick your ass today. Just get your ass, go down there just to get your ass kicked today. Yeah. And what this does is it always builds that core, that inside you, that fear, that that drive, that whatever that makes you now. It's all in your brain. I get it. I'm doing my chest. And we're talking about it like it's your heart. But I get it. It's all your brain. No, no. It's not. You're good. Uh, no, nobody's confusing like, that, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, if you're if you're looking at us for like super literal sciencey shit, you're on the wrong. No, nope, nobody's I'm confusing that. You're good. <laughs> Science is not why we join the army. But I just feel like it's a core of a guy and these skills like can build that core. And there's there's so much to that score. You know, there's, you know, humility. Go to the dojo. Get your ass kicked today. You know what I mean? Uh uh, and then I'm going to tell you, I don't care how good you are in the unit dojo, you're going to get your ass kicked one day. Like it oh, yeah, or not. You. not. You know what I mean? There's always somebody, there's always somebody better. You have oh. to have that mindset too. You know, I tell you what, going back to that though, I love that skill core. Uh, everybody wants the, the skill core, of course, the core skills, whatever you want to call it. But psychologically, you have to be ready to fight and win no matter what, because we look at you look at the different stats of these law enforcement officers or some of the vanilla military guys. Dude, it's not skill plays part of it. Physical ability plays part of it, but it's the mental ability that is the big winner. That you have to go in knowing you're going to win. You have to do this. Yeah, you know, every time you turn a corner and see you be. Every time I turn a corner, someone is going to be around the corner and they're going to try to kill me or my mates. So you have to know that. Otherwise, you, you can't be surprised once you turn a corner. It's right. like it's like the pistol. It's like when new shooters, every time they they move the pistol, uh, they you know they pull the trigger and move the gun at the same time. You have to know that this gun is going to explode in your hand every time you fire that, the pistol. Every time. You have to know that every time. But how, how many students have you seen how long it takes them to get over that? I don't know. Uh, there's something psychological about the boom that – it is psychological. A, a person, right? Yeah. And yeah. and I would say this is like, I'll tell you this is I think uh, also this is why me and you are where we are now because of the rip that you went through. They call it RASP today. But the rip that we went through produced fucking guys who won't quit. End of discussion. Now, when I got to Ranger Battalion, I didn't know shit about my fucking job. You know what I mean? I wasn't better at patrolling or, you know what I mean? I wasn't even good at shooting. Right. I wasn't anything at my job, but I can tell you this. You want to run, you want to road march, you want to whatever. I'm not going to quit and I'm not going down quit. as a hate casualty. So let's fucking do this. Now, I think there's so much to the way that was ran in creating the mindset of a kid who ain't never going to fucking stop, right? Now, I do think I like the way they do it these days. If I was going to do it these days, I'd do our rip 
with another three to four weeks of actual like gentleman's training. You know what I mean? Like no okay. bullshit. Let's show you how to shoot. No push ups. I mean, we're going to do PT every day. We're going to be fit, but like, let me show you how to shoot and let me try to get you as good as you can be while you're here. Cause once you leave getting better is a lot harder to do. You know what I mean? Especially in fucking combat. <clears throat> so I think, uh, you know, uh, the rip that produced us unmatched, unparalleled. Um, and I think the army needs that. I think, I think hazing with a purpose is great in the sense that, it works the same mentally as pain compliance, right? Simunitions, right? You come around the corner, you get shot in the face. Like, we're not going to do that again, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to watch out my sixth for now. Yeah. Pain and shame, yeah. <clears throat> they're great motivators. These are great things, great tools to to shape and, and form young men. Yes, 100%. Hundred percent. Yeah, I completely. So agree. yeah, I, you you can't you can't have hazing this out of control. You can't have some immature dude, you know, uh, telling you know three privates to go down to the laundry room with a with a five you know two quart canteen, your towel, and your favorite CD. You can't go do that. Right. And you can be out of control. You can't you know put hey put your greens on and wear a, a protective mask and we're gonna go do some push ups. That's stupid. Right. You have to you have to be able to control that stuff. And and you know, that's there's a fine line there. But man, yeah, they just you're right pain and shame it can work it can certainly yeah. work yeah i i believe that wholeheartedly man um okay so let's talk about uh you were one of the first dog guys right you know look you know I, you know this about me i like dogs i train you know i i train my dogs to sit i used to do some shits and stuff before it all and and really is i don't know kind of at a young age i realized having uh when i was a kid i had some just out of luck, we had like a black lab and he was always super good. He sat down, he stayed, he never ran off. Like he was just great. Right. So when I grew up and I started to get my own dogs, it was like, these motherfuckers are out of control. And I don't like that. You know, where <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know what I didn't know at the time was I like dogs that sit, stay, that are well behaved. You know what I mean? And then yeah. through the years, I've always kind of done that. My dogs are pretty well behaved. Uh, they listen pretty well. The newest ones, you know, like half a bulldog, half a pit bull. So she listens. She won't run off or anything, but you tell her to lay down and like she doesn't want to lay down. She's not laying down, but she won't move. And anyway, she's a she's a psycho compared to all the dogs I've had. But, uh, I'm I was fascinated in the beginning of the dog stuff because, you know, here I am already a team leader when the beginning started. Uh, I took dogs nightly. I took dogs with guys. I took the dog handler cause I worked with them. Right. Um, and I told him, come with me. I didn't know how to use the dog, but I was like, dude, you know, I'll take bodies. Like come with me, bring the dog. I like dogs, how we use them. We'll figure it out. Right. So that's kind of my mindset at a time where guys didn't even want to take dogs on missions because dogs fucking bite. You know what I mean? And if you it was a, yeah. a couple times, like, <laughs> yeah, you, you get nailed, man. You, you think about it big time. The, it was a new era, right? For sure. It was a new era. <clears throat> I'll tell you, um, I was fascinated with it too. When I was in, uh, OTC, that's when I first saw dogs on the, the big piece of grass there. And I was like, wow, that's, I'm, maybe I'd like to do that someday. Blah blah blah. Turned out to be those cats were in my the the place where I went, and mm -hmm. I I slide across the hallway, and here I'm working with those guys, and it was it was um it was an afterthought though almost the the animal itself was an afterthought. You know we get the idea from the Israelis, and you know the Israelis throw a camera on a dog and throw him in a hallway to see where the Palestinian is, and then they know where he is, and then they mark him and they, they use him for cannon fodder. Yeah. Uh, here we are. We're starting to really touch on the idea of integrating a canine during a, a, a CQB assault. Um, and, and at first you're right, nobody wanted them. And then even when we did a couple of them, not really coordinated, we did a couple, we didn't really train for it yet. We did a couple and then there was a loss. You guys had a loss and then we did some more later on and a guy might get bit. And then I was told by a senior guy, I was told by a senior guy, I said, you'll never CQB with a dog again. And then it was just probably a year after that where 
people said, I don't want to go in without one. Uh, you know, it up the stairs. With a, yeah, it did take long, man. And then what we figured it out, too. We finally got smarter. <laughs> And we started training them better. You know, we used to get dogs too. Right in the beginning, we got dogs that we, we said, well, I want a man killer. I want a man stopper. That's what I want. So we would get these dogs that were horrible man stoppers and we bite everybody. And the, you couldn't, we, we had to, we had to slow our roll down a little bit. Let's find a dog that will, that will sit with me anytime I want on a couch and we can parade him around the whole uh, element, you know, meetings, uh, helicopters, bombs, CQB, whatever. And then, but they could also hang out with you on the couch or the workbench or whatever, you know, and that's, that was hard. It was a fine line to do. And then yeah. we finally started yeah. breaking that. We started really finally breaking that, that line. And then only once in a while, would you have a guy who was a misfire? So, you know, yeah. my, my Valco was, psh, he'd, he'd come up to you in the middle of the night in the middle of the dark and a, a dark CQB hit and, put his paws right on your face, look at you and go, hmm, not you, push you away and go find the, the bad guy. Yeah, I think I was out uh -huh. with you guys and Velco before, believe it or not. Um, all right, what's the coolest thing you ever seen a dog do? Like, you're like, holy shit, this motherfucker right here. Like, anything good? I know, because I know Velco was your dog, right? So Yeah, he, he, I, I lost him in 2005, and I picked up another one, Kotha. He was really good, too, for a while, and then he decided... He wasn't that good anymore. He wanted to bite good people. Um, the coolest thing I ever saw a dog do. Um, one of the, man, there's numerous stories. I have numerous stories. <laughs> Tell me uh, all. I'll take them all. There, like, there was a really cool, uh, to me, like Valco, uh, would, a funny story, right? So here we are. We 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 finished with a, a hit. We got our bad guys lined up on the street, right? And we're in nods. I'm I'm moving around, dudes, whatever, and I'm I'm walking straight ahead. Nah, 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 nah. And I can't even see these moolies over here, man. I can't even see them. And whoo, my man pulls me off my feet to nail somebody, and just all by yourself. What are you doing, dude? Are you creating your own bites? <laughs> All right, stop that. You can't do that, right? That was one thing. Another cool thing, we uh, actually crashed a helicopter on uh, on on landing. It was a hard landing, so yeah. we had to end up. Hold getting, on, air uh, quotes. Hard landing. Uh, yeah, it was a hard landing. You can't say crash. Hard landing. Come on. It was a hard, we can't say crash. It was you a hard say, landing. Why do you think they it call a, it a hard landing? It was a crash. I mean, in the end, it was a controlled crash, but we didn't. Hard landing. You know, we didn't get hurt, die, or nothing. We right. jumped off the helicopter to do our assault. Valco snap bites a dude. At the at the door, we snap bite a dude at the door. We coordinate the assault, go in, by the dude. I think later on, we we got these guys lined up on the inside, and my man, uh, one of the guys is checking out the the prisoners again, and his lifeblood, right, his life force is ebbing out on the floor. He nailed his brachial artery. He hit him so hard, he broke his brachial artery, and he's just he's bleeding out back there. <laughs> we didn't even know it. Because it wasn't a hard bite. It did, when yeah. I saw it, I was like, yeah, it's, it's just a snap bite. That was pretty cool. One of the best things that Valco ever did, we did a, a covert hit. And uh, we're all in civilian clothes, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Valco pushes through the door. Uh, we got three operators on top of this cat. And uh, he pushes a dude out of the way. He just pushes a dude out of the way to nail this guy. And he's like... This, this is my job. Let me do it. And I'm just going to go ahead and get you out of the way. That was when I saw that, you know, that was one of the, the most beautiful things I've ever seen because he knew he understood exactly what we had been, you know, imposing on him the whole time in his brain, you know, yeah. push the good guy out of the way and you get you go ahead and you get in there and get that bite. Yeah. Um, and that's some of the coolest things I've ever seen. Uh, ridiculous things. Uh, hey, I'll Conan. tell you, I'll tell you go something ahead, I always thought was amazing check this out is the offset you know the 20k offset in western iraq you know what i mean like oh we walk in the night boys <laughs> actually there was a while we walked every night by the way but um so uh you're walking out in the western desert and you know out there's fucking moonscape walking in on these little towns you're walking in winds blowing towards you dogs won't even bark right it's perfect fucking setup we'd walk on these little towns and like we're in the middle of nowhere we're not even close to the town 
and you're walking along and you hear the dog's teeth start chattering, man. You know what I mean? And as soon as a dude would hear that, it'd be freeze everybody. Like there's someone within a hundred fucking yards from us. And those dogs are always fucking right. Always, always, always. I always thought that was amazing. I mean, think about it. You can't even get a hundred yards from us. That's pretty fucking good, you know? And it was always that. (laughs) You're like, Oh shit, this dude's playing it real right now. Like, you know what I mean? Like refocus my night vision, check my laser. Okay, let's see this, right? Uh, I always thought that was just amazing because it could, and I know it's a smell thing, right? And, but uh, I was always amazed at, especially that, you know. They, they, they could do some amazing things. Yeah. But they would, let, they would allow you to go from hero to zero in a heartbeat. John, I mean, it was, you know, you, you think that they're awesome and, uh, but man, you get in that situation where they bite a good guy and it's like you pull the trigger yourself. It's just horrible, yeah. man. Yeah. yeah. Here it is. You're in a heartbeat, man. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I remember Rudy used to come in the team room. We're like, Hey dude, what's up? How's your weekend? Oh yeah. High five. Rudy'd come in and be like, <laughs> It'd snag your hand and it like, it wouldn't be bad. Like, you know, like it just a little bit of tape, tape up your fingers or something. Right. Like, but like you'd be in the team room and then like, Hey, we got to socialize the dog today. I'd be uh, fists, hands against the body leaned against the table. Right. Like, so how was your weekend dude? Yeah. Mine's good. Like, Oh, Hey Rudy. Yeah. Good. Good boy. Good boy. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and pet him. Yeah, good boy, good boy. <laughs> he was sharp. He was sharp dog. Yeah, yeah, he was. But he, but he was one of the first dogs. So we saw again. He was sharp and he was pretty good in in theater. But we didn't do it right with him. We didn't do it right with a couple others. Wilson was really bad. Right, he bit three guys before he got Wilson. fired from the program. Me being one of the guys, he bit really hard. Um, I got stuck in the hospital for that. You know, so it just man, it was it was a fine line. We learned our lessons, but. Sadly, we, we got a couple good guys, but yeah, yeah, no. Hey, look, uh, you can't have an omelet and not crack them eggs. You know what I mean? Like, I every time I was bit, was I mad about it? Did I uh, move my hands around the dog? Did it take me a couple years after being bit by the initial dogs a few times to like, uh, you know, get used to the dogs? But I'll tell you, this is like quickly. We had dogs that were like family you know fucking dog roam the house come jump on the couch with you fucking 20 minutes later fucking dragging a dude down for you and and then look that's a soldier you know what i mean i mean think about you know this is uh conceptually one of those things where it's a whole different capability honestly it truly is you know what i mean it's like it's it's almost like wearing uh the the uh you know the 36s you got your Anvis goggles with a thermal overlay. You got two spectrums. That dog brings a whole nother spectrum to this that we, with no technology, could could replicate on our own. You know what I mean? I, I can't tell you how many times, too, I've tried to take that same kind of speech and push it towards a constabulary and say, you know, are you integrating canines yet? Have you started integrating canines? Do you understand the life-saving ability to work your canine in the building first uh, with uh, with a camera device or something else, you know. And a lot of constabulars are so funny. They're run by, uh, well, they're all run by civilians. Of course, we know this, but they're run by these, these commissioners and council members who think that it's so visceral, it's so horrible for an animal to bite a person that they, they want. They have dogs on the force, but they won't even use them. And it's a, it's a real shame. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And oh, by the way, I've seen that same kind of reaction in a man that passed election. You know, guys would be so, oh, get him off. Get the dog off him. I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, let the dog do his work. Uh, not lethal in 50 states, man. Stop it. Just let my dog do the work. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's stop. visceral. That was never me. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't going to hear stop out of this guy. <laughs> Especially when the dog feels the way the dog does. You know what I mean? Yeah, the, yeah. the dog knows these motherfuckers. He knows, right? Like, and, and he can sense that. And, and that's, that's stuff we can't do. You know what I mean? It's just stuff we can't do. I love dogs, man. I think it's, a, I think it's an added value. I also think like, um, I think the, the unit could, could benefit from using more different kind of dogs in certain roles you know what i mean like you know uh hey i had to go out to uh perth 
uh, <laughs> to the SAS in Australia, right? Tough, tough duty out there. Yeah. And uh, a, my squadron was already there. I graduated like free fall school, came to the building and they handed Oh, me- did you do the Olympics? Uh, no, no. Uh uh-uh. uh, that was that was right. Was that right before you? Uh huh. I missed it. Uh, I missed uh, it. So they give me a stack of tickets like this. I'm like, where the fuck do I got? You know, remember the old ticket days? <laughs> tickets and cash, not like credit cards and shit. Anyway, uh, I'm like, where the fuck am I going? Right. So I had to go to Australia. I land. I'm in Sydney. Right. And then I got to check bags, go through customs, and then a local flight to Perth. Right. Yep. I go to get my luggage and I just finished OTC. So I got to pack the whole packing list in my luggage. So I got all my training gear, everything, right? Uh, so this fucking beagle, a fucking beagle, this little fucking beagle, right? He sits on my bag and I'm just like watching it go around. <laughs> like, I don't even want to go get my bag because I know you ain't supposed to bring that shit to Australia, right? I know they don't like that shit, right? So. Finally, uh, I walk up and I'm like, hey, uh, sir, I think your beagle's on my bag, you know? And he was like, he's like, mate, you got some contraband in there? And I was like, sir, I'm going to Campbell Barracks. And he was like, oh, shit, mate. Whistles to the dog. Dog goes off. He's like, all right, mate, whatever's in there is good by us then. (laughs) And uh, and he let me go, right? But, like, I was so nervous, that little beagle company. (laughs) Hey, my grandpa always had beagles. Those little motherfuckers. My grandpa's beagle would run off two, three weeks chasing deer, come back, lose 30 pounds, look like he's dead, ticks all over him, lay around for a couple weeks, and then he'd be gone again. So I know them beagles are like fucking, you know, crazy about smell, and they got drive. You know what I mean? So oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm fucked. Yeah, there's different applications for sure, but you know, it, was a, it was an ambassador. We were doing a Capex, and the ambassador said, well, why don't you use uh, smaller dogs like a beagle? I said, because the smaller beagle can't take down that 180 pound dude that just ran well, out of that car. <laughs> yeah, but uh, a beagle, if if the job was to smell something out, I would use a dog as just a smeller, right? And yeah, I, yeah. I would I would train a fucking man killing dog to protect this beagle to the nth degree. You know what I mean? Like fuck <laughs> with the beagle. You know what I mean? And fucking old Rudy over here is gonna eat your fucking face. Don't even touch that beagle, right? So. Uh, but yeah, I think dogs, you know, look, it's a, it's a capability that, you know, what do you got to do? Honestly, I know dog training is, is, it requires a lot. It's got to happen every day. I get it. But if you want to be the world's best, this is people too. It's is what it you anyways? do anyway, right? It's what you do anyway. You, you got to work every day. Yeah, totally. I'd have done it anyway. So, um, Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. So, uh, let, t- let's talk about what you do now. Kind of post retirement, you retired in 13, did some government yeah. stuff. I did the same thing. And then I started to, to shoot myself. So kind of walk through post retirement <laughs> where you are now. Yeah. Post retirement. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds I'm, better that way. Doesn't it? It does. It's uh, cause I'm not retired yet. You know what I'm saying? Post <laughs> post army retirement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So now, um, I pretty much just, First year, I made a big calendar. Uh, we're in this year. We're in. I just got back from Alabama. I did uh, Alex City, Alabama, Alexander City, Alabama. Ten guys down there in a SWAT team. Uh, some open enrollment classes down there too. Uh, we're going to Red Hill, Georgia this year. We're doing Sawmill in Lawrence, South Carolina. We're doing Traycraft Range in in, in Maluki, Florida. Uh, we're doing all kinds of stuff this year and bouncing all around and trying to get. Um, Let's see what else I do. Uh, Terre Haute, Indiana. Yep, working to SWAT guys up there. Uh, Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Hopefully, um, there's, you're just bouncing around and training. And yeah, predominantly rifle, pistol, CQB. Um, the Canada integration is pretty much a tertiary thing. And if 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 any law enforcement agency out there wants to do that, we can. But uh, usually, we don't get a lot of uh, call for that just yet. What is that? Uh, we, what is that? It, the canine integration, you mean? Oh, canine integration. I thought you said yeah. candidate. I was like, oh, candidate integration. I don't I even know what that means. Canine. Maybe I, would, maybe I had junk in my, my mouth. Hey, we both got the uh, crud. It's that time of year. Huh? A bunch of shit in my mouth. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so you can find me at DutchChrisMoyer.com, which is weird in itself. Uh, Dutch Chris Moyer Actual is on IG, which is 
weird. I hate the social media plans, but in the end, you got to do advertising some sort of way. We're on shootingclasses.com too. Um, and uh, really YouTube, Dutch Chris Moyer. So weird. But that's <laughs> I, it I is weird, that's man. Weird. I mean, that's your name, like it is. I, I know, but it's so all. weird. It's the whole thing. It's just it bothers me some sort of way. Just, hey, look, if, it, when, if when I could do it started, a different way, I would. Think about this. I mean, you have an advantage over me. When I started in like I don't know, thirteen ish, when I started doing this regularly, uh, Facebook wasn't even a real like you have to have it yet. You know what I mean? And people yeah, are like, right. you got to have Facebook. I'm like, never had it in my life. Don't even give a fuck. Fuck you. And uh, boy, was I wrong. You know what I mean? Like you got to have social media. Well, here I am. How many years later? You know, I don't even know how many followers I got, but it's a ton. And who knew just fucking around doing stupid shit on, you, you know, find but, out how many, uh, I mean, you yeah, have a lot. You have to do it. Yeah. I don't even know how many it is, but uh, I would say it's this is like, uh, you got to do it. It's a business, right? I'd also tell you this is treat it like a business. Don't be fucking putting your personal comments out. Treat it like a business. I do. And you'll have less problems. You know what I mean? But I would tell you is whether they want to talk about it or not, we are getting shadow banned. Like, like you fucking read. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You, you can't find me unless you type in every letter exactly right. I won't pop up if you just type a S or I just had to do it. I just had to do it. And this this one this is not you. This is a fake one because this is only two posts. This is not you. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, and there's fake ones out there. It's a fucking world, man. Look, I would say this is like the world's yeah. a crazy place. I say this every fucking time we talk about shit. But also think about this. <sighs> And I don't even want to go into, yeah, I don't even want to go into this, but what I would say is I think there's more propaganda on the TV right now because of, I don't even want to say the U word, but because of Ukraine, we are caught in between our propaganda machine and the Russians propaganda machine. And, and I the Ukrainian. Come- yeah, Ukrainian and, propaganda machine. Yeah, too. they got their own fucking shit. And then anyone in the world who's got their own propaganda for their own fucking reasons, like. And yeah. dude, I, you brought up a new, you brought up, I, we could talk about this for hours. So we, we, the collective, we, the United States of America, right? The Congress and the Senate just signed up what? $15 billion for Ukrainian aid. Yep. That's for the Ukrainian border. And we haven't even put any money into our own border. Nope. Our numbers, the numbers already this year are much higher than last year. And last year was the highest ever in the, in the, what, what are we doing? Um. We're, I don't know. This is what we're looking at right now. And I, I will bend feathers. I will make people go, what? I will do whatever you want to call it. But this, this is an active destruction of America as we know it. This is, you know, this along with the Great Reset, which is not a conspiracy. It's a real thing. Look it up. Uh, would go to the World Economic Forum. I'm not some sort of wacko. I don't wear a tin hat. These, these are people that are actively destroying the West as we know it today. To, to farm, to find some sort of control and, and equity for all. And it's never going to happen. Utopia isn't real. It's never going to happen. Right. You know, and this right. digital currency is a new thing. This is a new, the new crisis. So now we're going to institute a digital currency. Let's see here. That means I can't tell Johnny to mow my lawn and give him a $10 bill. I can't have Susie walk my dogs and give her a, a 15, uh, $15 in cash. And then every time you want to do anything the government knows exactly what you're doing and people want this yeah people want this ridiculous you, what do you what do you want do you want a, a barcode in your hand so you can bow to the oligarchs of amazon and and google no yeah. no people want yeah that's what they want right i'd also say this look i was at the hockey game and like you know towards the end of the hockey game i know i gotta drive home it's an hour and a half right um, so I start drinking water, right? So I go up there to just get a couple bottles of water and I had some cash in my wallet just out of fucking luck, right? So I figure I get me and my wife a bottle of water. I go to pay for them and I go to hand the guy cash and he's looking at me and the manager is this lady standing next to him. She's like, oh, you're trying to pay cash? A oh, wink, wink, something's going on. I'm like, lady, I'm trying to buy two bottles of water. I had a few dollars in my pocket. Like there is nothing wink, wink about me paying for two bottles of water with cash. 
And bes- besides the bartender who was a cool guy, get feed me drinks the whole game, right? Was like, dude, we don't even take cash, which I didn't even know. I just thought don't like don't take cash for a couple bottles of water. I figured I'd just pay the exact amount and walk off. Yeah. Right? And and the uh, lady's like, oh, you're paying cash? Wink, wink. Something's going on. It's like. I was like, there's no wink, wink with fucking buying bottles of water with some dollar bills, lady. Like, how was this wink, wink? But this is what people think, man. You know, you're right. I agree with you wholeheartedly. This is what people think. It's 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 going to be very interesting what's going to happen in the next couple of years, in the next four years. This midterm will be interesting. The general election in, in 24 will be interesting. This uh, this how much damage can they create? You know, I don't know. How, I don't know. I don't even want to end on that note, but, uh, okay. So look, uh, my man Dutch hit me up a, a couple months ago. We were wanting to do this. You know, as you know, we already said this, this is the fucked up. I fucked up one. <laughs> we had to redo it. So, I know. Fucking God. Uh, but I'm glad I just had time, man. Um, I'd known this guy since 1992 or three when you went to Rico, you know what I mean? Um, so, uh, look, check him out. He's on the road. He's teaching classes. Right. Um, I I would say this is like, people ask me about leadership all the time. Like what's the biggest, whatever of leadership. And you know what I think it is? Cause there's so many factors. Leaders have a certain amount of energy. That is the, the wind you need to carry you somewhere. Right. And I think all things being equal. Right. And, and I think like, you guys like us, our generation, we possess this. And, I, and I'd say there's one more thing you possess that you don't even know about is the ability to string a plan together, which is just a series of wins. Make sense? Like I try to explain this to SWAT teams, police departments, like, oh, I'll show you how to do this, but we need an institution of winning and winning situations, right? And every situation we come across, how do we win this one and that one and this one and that one? And I think this is what most people forget when they look at training. Like, well, I just want to do CQB training, right? Like, okay, that that's great. But CQB is one thing and it's a skill. However, right, you need the leadership and the ability to uh, make sure that not only did we do CQB, but we won outside the house. We won all the way to the house. I win inside the house. I'll win outside the house again, and I will win on the way back, you know, before uh, I go to bed tonight. And I always try to explain this to people, but I never feel like police in this country or people that haven't experienced this, right? Um, I always feel like they this is the piece they miss. And then when you try to show it to them, right, it's really hard for them to replicate because all they're going to leave with is the skill you got, right? And I just feel like there's this winning mindset that we possess, you possess, all the guys. It's not just me, right? Um, and that mindset is is what takes training from just skills to we could fucking pull this off no matter what. You know what I mean? I like it. I like it. And uh, you're you're one of those guys, right? And so, look, if you're listening to this, go check him out. DCM Consulting, Dutch Chris Moyer, longtime Ranger buddy of mine, right? Look, even look at when I buzz it out. What? I got my Whoa. Ranger tag. <laughs> I had my, my berets over there. I thought about bringing it over here. but What? Um, but, all right, man. <laughs> hey, look, I'm glad you called. Don't be a stranger. You need anything for me? You want to do this again? Just let me know. We'll do this again now that I know the settings a little bit better. Uh, same, same, but, same, same. Uh, and listen, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm going to try to do this thing myself too, and do a podcast. So I will I'll reach out to you and go, come on, get on the program, dude. And uh, we'll, dude, we'll I'll get you on. I'll, I'll, I'll show you how to do this. I'll show you how I do this. Too easy. All right. All right. Um, hey, guys, I'm the sheriff of Baghdad, John McPhee, right? I'm going to give the last over to my man, Dutch. So, Dutch, tell us where he can find us. Tell us tell us where guys could look into you at, right? Yeah, one more time. It's DutchChrisMoyer.com is the website. Uh, Dutch Chris Moyer Actual is IG and Facebook as well. And uh, Dutch Chris Moyer on YouTube. Um, if here's one of the things we do too, if you out there want a class and you're in Oklahoma, Arkansas, wherever, it doesn't matter, Arizona, whatever. And if you have 10 guys that you want to bring on, 
you contact me, info at dutchchrismoyer.com, and then you will be free. We'll let you, you know, if you organize that whole thing, you're free. Those other cats will get paid, but you, you'll be free for that. So just let us know. Give us a holler. Awesome, man. All right. Thanks, Dutch. And uh, guys, thanks, uh, wait for the next podcast.